and I see this motorcycle pull up outside. He walked straight in, pulled out a huge gun and blew the side of this guy's head off. Bomb! Jeez! Hey folks, Pete here from Tyrish Times. What's the story? So today I'm going to interview a gentleman named Paul Wallace, who has spent 36 years in Thailand. And in Paul's younger years, he considered himself to be the ultimate backpacker. He traveled all around the world with little or no money to his name. Sometimes he was completely broke and he still managed to travel and have amazing adventures. And in this interview, Paul's going to tell us about a time in the late 80s when he spent 14 months in rural Thailand. When I say rural Thailand, we're talking before the internet. You know, he was in a town where nobody spoke English and he didn't speak Thai at that time. Paul said people were traveling 50 kilometers into this town, into this village to see Paul because they'd never seen a foreigner before. So Paul's going to tell some hilarious stories today and he's going to tell one extremely tragic story and you've seen the title so you know what's coming. So folks, if you like this interview and you're curious to know more about who Paul Wallace is, I'll leave a link to another video below in the comment section of another interview I did with Paul and you can learn more about Paul's story. So let's get into the interview. If you like it, hit the like button, leave me a comment. I always love reading your comments, I really do. And subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Let's get into it. Paul, back again. Yes. It's great doing the stories with you, Paul. You're a great storyteller. Well, I know I said never again, but you should never say never. There you go. So uh, yeah, I have a few more tales. Yeah, we're gonna get that, straight that into them today. Me. So. You've spent 36 years in Thailand. Up to now, yes. Yeah. Yes. And when you got over here initially, you weren't living in a city. We're on the outskirts of Bangkok right now as we film this, but that was not always the case, yeah? You spent a number of months living in rural Thailand back in the late 80s? Yes, I did, yes. All right. I guess you could call it total immersion. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the, the first one we did. I took a train to Nakhon Si Tamarat, which is a big city in the south, and, and uh, met this monk, and he invited me to stay at the temple. Um, and after a couple of weeks of being at the temple, he came to see me and said, listen, I'm going to a Buddhist monastery in England, in Hertfordshire. So I won't be around, you know, I'm going next week and, you know, it's been really nice to meet you. And I said to him, you're my lifeline here, yeah, you know, and nobody speaks English. There was nobody that I'd seen who could speak English. Which part of Thailand was this? Nakhon Si Tamarat. It's probably a hundred kilometers south of Surat Thani. And how did you end up going there? Uh, the pin in the map. You remember I told you about, I used to do the pin in the map, so I, I, I got southern Thailand up close of my eyes and bump, and it landed in Nakhon Si Tamarat, so bought a one-way ticket, third class. So I'm sitting on the floor with the farmers and their chickens and their bags of rice and drinking their rice whiskey with them, a long train ride overnight. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I ended up in this village. It was called uh, Dontro, and it was in Emperor Chinyai um, district. And my arrival was, you'd have thought Tom Cruise has just arrived, you know. Children everywhere, people around, and they're all looking at me. Children coming up to me and touching me on the leg, because they'd never seen anyone with fair skin before. And that was, I spent 14 months in that village and uh, it was a unique experience for me in many ways. Well, let me ask you a question, Pete. Have you ever been totally cut off from any form of communication? 
No, never. Not my generation. I've right. always had access to the right. internet. Well, well, during my earlier travels, you know, around Europe backpacking, I'd been in that situation a few times, but never more than a few days, you know. <coughs> All of a sudden, I'm confronted with a situation whereby I can't talk to anyone at all. The monk said to me, we've had so many people in the community who want you to come and stay at their house. So we kind of thought we, maybe you could go and stay at this guy's house for a few weeks and then go on to somebody else's house and somebody else's house. And I thought, yeah, this would be great, you know. I'll get to see how they live down here. And uh, I nearly lost my sanity, Pete, after three or four weeks of not being able to talk to anyone. I used to talk to myself. And I started writing in my journal. And it's weird, but that was the only way. You, you know, I think human beings, we have to have expression, don't we? You know, and we take it for granted that we can express ourselves. But it's only when you can't, that it becomes... And what kind of things would you would you talk to yourself about? I'd be sitting in a room with four or five ties, you know, and they we were eating some food, and I and they'd be all talking away and looking at me and laughing, and you know, and I'd sort of say, sit there, and I they they thought it was so funny, and I'd say, well, Paul, how are you doing today? You know, where are you today? And I go, well, I'm in this very lovely family house in Donthrow Village here, and they'd all laugh as I'm doing this, you know. And were you working down there? No, I wasn't. I had, I had an agreement whereby I would, I would teach the kids. Uh, used to do that every day for an hour and a half after school. And in return for that, I, I got fed and I got a place to stay. And they, they, they really did receive me like I was royalty. I mean, going back to those days, the late 80s, even walking around Bangkok, you would get a lot of looks. But down there, people were coming 50 kilometers so they could see this Falang guy because they'd never seen one in real life, you know. And what kind of comments would they make when, when they see a foreigner for the first time? What would they say about you? Because it must be an unusual experience for them. Um, yeah, and, and initially we, we obviously had big problems because I couldn't really talk to them, you know. Um, I learnt the language about as quickly as it would be humanly possible to learn because I had no choice, you know. And I, I pretty soon learned, oh, okay, well, these are numbers. And, uh, and they'd always say to me, Benay! And I had to answer, Bacon! That's where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to Nakhon Si Tamarat. And the stressful thing for me was, I could not, there were, there were no tarmac roads in this village. They were just dirt tracks, you know, but well-worn dirt tracks where the buffalo go along and the motorcycles and pickups. And I could not walk past somebody's house without them going, Falang! And I'd have to sit with the man on his little red raised platform and drink at least two of these 40 degree Lao Cao shots before they'd let me go on my way. You know. And the conversation would be something like, Benay, you know, they can't, oh, oh, oh. you know, and, and he, after about six weeks, you know, I could, I, I could begin to tell what people's characters were like, even though I couldn't understand the language. Oh, he's a funny guy. He makes people laugh. He's a bit miserable, you know. Um, some of the funny things that happened down there, there in, in the Thai culture, you, in the rural areas, you have somebody who's called the Puyai Ban. Okay, he's the head man of the village. Now he will have loud, loud speakers all set all around the village. And in the daytime, you know, he'd be telling you about, well, the government are bringing some new strains of rice and they want us to try out these, so come to the AMPA, you know, on this day and this time and the government will give you all these new seeds and all this kind of stuff. Of course, I had no idea what they're saying. And one night, it must have been 1 a.m., I didn't like it, but I knew there was nothing I could do about it. I was very much a showpiece, you know. As far as other villages were concerned, when there was a funeral, they'd always want me to go. 
you know. And of course, I'm very aware of I'm in a foreign culture here. I've got to be nice, you know, and do all the things I'm supposed to do. And and, and it, this emerges as a pattern. They take me to a funeral. You know. Lots of loud music going on and flashing LED lights, which I thought was a bit strange for a funeral, but there you go. And uh, I would eventually get invited to the old man's area and they'd all be sitting on these raised bamboo things, you know, all, all of them in a circle. And the, the game for them was to get the Falang drunk on the rice whiskey. Of course, they, they, they didn't know me and uh, you know, being a big drinker, I thought one day I got I got fed up with it, you know. I'd have to sit there and then they, we'd all do this smile and then they'd give me one or two of these drinks and I'd go, nah, and they'd all go, <laughs> This one time I thought, no, no, I'm going to turn this one around the other way. So seven or eight guys sitting around there, all quite old, and they invite me and I go down there and then the guy gets the glass and pours the shot out for me and he says, pop, down it goes. And I saw what they were doing. It was every now and again, one of them would pick up the bottle and he'd fill everybody's glass up. So I did that three times in half an hour. Chinked the glasses, they all thought it was great. And I then, I, let's get another bottle over here, another bottle of 40 degree. And we drank all of that. And now they're starting to look at me a bit like this. And I'm drunk, you know, but I thought, I'm not going to show it. So I said, uh, okay. This is wonderful. Shall we have another one? No, 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 no. Pull out, pull out, pull out. And I, I heard later on that three of them never made it home. They fell asleep in the paddy fields and had to get woken up by their wives. <laughs> you drank them yeah, under the table? Uh, well, yeah, I, I did. Oh, I, I, I played the game they wanted me to play, but I just took it a little bit further, you know. And that was one of the things I didn't like about being there, is if I passed somebody's house and the owner of the house saw me, and I'd have to drink at least two of these shots. So if I wanted to go to the, the temple, that involves four stoppages, you know, and I couldn't say no. I thought, no, no, I have to do this. And I became a bit of a celebrity with these guys. Yeah. Um, how about the lifestyle of the people there? I imagine they are mostly rice farmers, were they? Rice farmers, coconuts. Yeah, mainly rice farmers. And What's coconuts. their daily life like? What time do they get up? How many hours a day are they working? Right. They'll get up at the crack of dawn and the women and the older children will do all the housework before eight o'clock in the morning. And then they take out all the buffalo you know, the, the buffalo know where they've got to go and they get to their spot and they'll bang this peg in the ground and leave the buffalo there. Um, they get everything done that they could by 10 a.m. because it became so hot after that. And then after that, they'd just be laying around in hammocks under their houses, you know, trying to keep out of the sun. They could not understand that I would walk around in the sun with no shirt on. You know, they, they, they want to be white. They all come up to me and say, you know, you got white skin. And I'd lift up my shirt. I said, look, look at that. <laughs> yeah, they loved it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was quite difficult. There was one time that I, 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 I remember fondly. Um, I, I, I tried to eat their food, Pete. You know, these tiny fish with this hot paste and the rice. And I, I just couldn't get on with it. So I, I would once a week, I'd go to the city. 30 miles on a pickup taxi, you know, the BART taxi. And I'd go to the supermarket and buy ham uh, and, and a little bit of butter and bread. And so I get back one day to the house where I'm staying and I'm in the kitchen and I'm making these ham sandwiches with mayonnaise and a bit of salad, you know. And these three young boys, the Thai boys are there. And I says, try it, you know. So I cut off a bit for one of them. went back to his little fish and his rice, you know, and I thought to myself, you see how different we are? You know, they couldn't eat that, just like I couldn't eat their food. So I, They probably found it tasteless. Yeah, they right. Spice. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. But the people were, were really, really good to me. And how about your, um, say, your English vocabulary, right? If you're in an area where you're not speaking English, or you're only speaking English to yourself, I suppose, 
I was surprised, Pete, to be honest with you. 14 months, I think it was, I stayed there. And every three months, I used to get on the train and go down to um, uh, the border with Malaysia. And I, I'd go to, um, what's that island called? Uh, Penang. I'd go to the Thai embassy in Penang and just renew my visa, you know, because in those days you could go in as out as many times as you wanted, you know, and that's what all the foreigners used to do. Um, and after 14 months of that, I made the decision that, okay, enough's enough. Let's go to Bangkok. Let's get a job as an English teacher. Let's get so, some money, you know. So I'm on the train now going to Bangkok and I meet these European guys. Hey, well, how are you doing? Where, where do you come from, man? I says, I, I from, I from England. And they kind of looked at me and pigeon English was coming out. You know, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> there it was. And they, they gave me a wide berth because they thought, you know, if he's a Brit, he wouldn't be speaking like that. They thought you were a dodgy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that was a, uh, and of course my biggest, my biggest gripe about coming back to Bangkok was after 14 months living in the South, I picked up the Southern Thai language. I could have a little a basic conversation in the Thai, uh, Southern Thai dialect. And as soon as I got to Bangkok and I could listen to the people, I'm like, I don't understand a word. I got to do it all again. You know, I've got to go through all the whole thing again because, as you probably know, the Thais have got such dialects where people in the south don't speak like people in the north, you know, or Isan. So I had to go through it all again in Bangkok and, and uh, yeah. I can hear loud isn't the word, but I can hear his tannoy, you know, his PA system going up and he's talking in a rather slurred way. So, the man of the house, you know, he's awake and I said, what's going on, what's going on? So I then find out that the Puyai Ban is drunk and he's complaining about this water being spilt on his bed so he can't get to sleep and he's quite unhappy about his this and quite unhappy about that. And all of a sudden, it just stopped dead. And the Thai guy says to me, the wife's gone behind his thing now and she's pulled out the cord so he's still sitting there talking to people but he's not we can't hear him anymore which i thought was quite funny you know so he'd, he'd use the pa system during the day but then in the evenings if he wasn't happy about something or he didn't have anyone to talk to he'd blast it out in the middle of the night so everybody could hear you know i actually got in trouble with the puyai button what happens well in my backpack, I had this survival book that I bought before my trip. Hardcore survival stuff, you know, how to survive in the wilderness. And I'm bored, you know, I ain't got a lot that I can do there. I kick the crawl ball around with the young guys and I teach the English in the afternoon, but I'm bored. So I decided, well, okay, then let me set up a wild animal trap in the jungle and see if I can't catch something, you know. So I got the book out and got my, my knife out and scrounged some rope and this and that. And I hooked up this trap where there's a loop and there's a piece of, I put a piece of cooked pork in the middle of it and set it all up and came back to the house. It was only 300 meters from where I was staying, but inside the jungle. And I forgot all about it. And a couple of hours later, I heard this whack. Ow, 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 ow. And people go running in there, and it was the Puyai Ban's dog. Oh, no. Yeah, a big Heinz 57 variety, you know. And he got, he got in there, and he got his foot. And when they get to him, like, he, he's hanging upside down with this. So I get ushered in to see the Puyai Ban. And it took quite a while for them to explain to me. But they said, basically, look, any wild animals in, in this place here have all been eaten. You know, there aren't any left, really. So don't be putting any traps out because you're likely to catch people's dogs or chickens. And so I was made to promise to the Puyai Ban that I wouldn't do it again. I didn't, yeah. I stayed at one house and they're quite close together, you know, so I'd say about 15 meters away from me would be the, the daughter of the family. Ah, drop dead gorgeous. 
and she'd be doing the washing and all she'd have on is this big sarong with a big knot in it, you know. And I'd sit there in the mornings, early mornings, and I couldn't help but look to her. I was drawn to her, you know. Doing her washing and I'd watch the big knot, you know, and it would slowly, slowly, slowly getting undone. And I thought, and I knew she's got nothing on under that, you know. So being a young guy, I'm just like, and every time when it got to the point where it would go, she would go, <laughs> every time. <laughs> Weeks I watched this thinking, hey, she's going to miss it one day. Did she know you were watching? I'm not sure. Possibly. Possibly. But yeah, that was a funny one. Um, quite a lot happened to me in that 14 months. Uh, a very traumatic experience. I'd already got to know the younger guys in the village, the 17, 18 year olds who liked to kick the, the bamboo ball around, you know, and I'd been a bit of a soccer player, so I liked that. And these guys used to smoke their bong and all this, you know. So. And one day, it was a very hot day in April, about 10 o'clock in the morning, they ushered me to go with them. So we arrive at this house. It's a single story house, typical Thai style, with basically one big room inside, you know. And on the wall is this TV. It's not a flat screen, it's one of the big old analog ones, you know, on a frame. And underneath it is sitting this guy, sitting there cross legged um, with his remote, and he's watching the TV. So we are in this house and we're sitting by the window, smoking the bowl. And I see this motorcycle pull up outside and the guy's got a, a, a zip anorak on. And I remember thinking to myself, God, how do they wear stuff like this in this heat, you know? <laughs> he walked straight in, didn't even acknowledge us three who were on the right, pulled out a huge gun, I think it was a Magnum 44 or something like that, and blew the side of this guy's head off in with one shot. Bomb! Jeez! The two guys who were with me grabbed me, we jumped out of the window and we ran away. Half an hour later we, we went back and there was a crowd of people around the house and everything and this guy's laying there on the floor. I found out later on what it was. The, the house owner had a Mia Noi, you know, a minor wife. And the Mia Noi's brother older brother didn't like this. So he'd gone to the guy twice before this and said, don't be seeing my sister anymore. And the guy ignored him. Three months after that, I see the guy who shot him at a funeral. And I'm like, how come he's out? We well, paid the money, paid the family some money. And I think he was in jail for a fortnight and he's out now. You know. How much money would he, have, would he have had to pay for basically murder? I wouldn't. I, I, at, at that time, I would think it would at least have been two or three hundred thousand baht, at least. Mm. Did this guy have like connections that he'd be able to? I, I really don't know, Pete, to be honest with you, but, but uh, I never actually spoke to the guy. He recognized me at a funeral and just looked at me and smiled and wide, you know, and I thought, oh boy. Um, it was a big shock to me, yeah, big shock. I'd never, I'd never ever been any close to anyone who'd ever been shot before. The smell, the sound. Yeah, that was a big shock. That was a big shock. But yeah, I often wonder what's happening down in that village. I actually found it on Google Earth the other day. They've got tarmac roads in the village now and all this kind of thing. Um, I was once taken to a bullfight, yeah? Now this isn't the Matador bullfight, which I think is a terrible sport, by the way. You know, I, I love every, every creature, and to do that to an animal is terrible. But the Thai bullfighting was, there was a big circle, and there's a way in and a way out, and the two bulls get in there, and there's always an escape route, you know, and the one that, that once out, he's out, and the other one wins. And these, these guys took it seriously. I mean, they did. You'd see one guy, and he'd be jogging in the morning with his little bamboo stick with his big prize bull, and it's, it was like a thoroughbred, you know, and he'd be tap it on the butt bum a little bit. And he'd <laughs> Mosquito net over it every night for him, but not for the 
the family, you know, they, they, they give it to him. So I find out there's this big bullfight going on. And these guys are all laughing their heads off and getting all their money out. And I, I then, they try to explain to me what's going on. And what was happening was they had a bullfight set up in the next village. And it was set up for Saturday afternoon. And these guys had bought some tiger urine, right? They bought some tiger urine and they sprayed it on their bull a couple of hours before the fight started. And, and sure enough, once the other bull got anywhere near it, didn't want to know. You know, it, it must have somehow known what that smell is. And they, made, they cleaned up these guys, they made loads of money. But yeah, yeah. So quite, gambling was big business back then, was it? Cock fighting, uh, yeah. The bull fighting, yeah, yeah. Ga ga I, I, you know, the prohibition taught us many things. If you make something illegal, it's going to flourish. I'm the kind of guy that likes to earn his keep. Whenever I travelled, you know, before, if there was any work to be done, I'd be doing it. And so I'm at this one house where they got me to stay and I can see they got all this long grass going down one side of the fence. So I borrow the hook, you know, the size and get out there with my shirt off and I'm hacking away all this and the, and the woman came out and she went, oh, and I thought, oh dear, I've done something wrong here, you know. Perhaps they were growing something there and I shouldn't be doing this. And then they, they, they went to get somebody else and he came and said, no, no, you can't do this. And I said, well, why? I'll do anything for them, you know, pulling up the water from the well every day. He said, no, 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 you're a phalang and you're a guest in their house. And if you do manual labor around their house, boy, that won't look good on them, you know. Other people will be saying, well, you, you've got a phalang staying with him and you've got him cutting the grass. What's going on here? Of course, I, that never entered my head that people might think like that way. So I was barred from doing any work. No, 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 you can't do any work. Uh, it does a difference in culture there yeah. for, for us. You probably think it's, you're, you're doing a good thing uh, for yeah, them, you know, I, you're helping I, them out. Whenever I stay with anyone, I would say to them, okay, what can I do? You know, I can carry stuff, I can garden, I can do this, do that. But not in that situation. And I had to understand it. And I thought, well, okay, yes, I got to see it from their side. So yeah, they, 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 they didn't allow me to do any work. So you're 66 now. I'm 66 right? now. Will you ever go back and do like a pilgrimage and go back to your some of your favorite places or where I'll be gone? You know, Pete, I don't think I would because it would be so different. It would be so different. And, and I don't know, I'm always, the, I'm the kind of guy, I don't know, I, I like to, to look forward to things and turn the next page rather than going back. Um, I'd like to meet some of the people I met, the, 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 the boxer in Patty, I'd like to hook up with him again. Stories are fantastic. Love well, them. Love I, them. I, I, as time goes by, I remember more and I'm like, oh yeah, what about that? What about this? I keep telling him, start a YouTube channel. Well, he has a channel, but I keep saying, I do, yeah. get the videos going there, Paul. Get them going. I do. Anyway, yeah. folks, if you like that, hit the like button, leave us a comment, subscribe to the channel. Uh, links to my books are in the description, by the way. Yeah, check out Paul's books in the description. Of course, we'll do that. Absolutely. Cheers, everyone. Great.